Welcome back home, COP family. To prioritize your safety, please listen closely as we remind you of these health and safety protocols required by the Department of Health and the IATF. All COP campuses will be thoroughly disinfected before members are allowed to come in. Before entering the COP premises, always wear a face mask. Please undergo temperature scanning. Use the disinfecting mats. While inside COP, use the sanitizing stations every 20 minutes. Take note of our social distancing markers around the campus. Always follow the signs and maintain the flow. Use the foot markers when queuing. Use the assigned stairs when going up or down. When finding your assigned seat or exiting the auditorium, please approach our friendly ushers and they will gladly assist you. Please remember that you can only sit on chairs with a red marker. A safety officer will always be present to assist you for any concerns regarding the mentioned protocols. We're doing our best to help keep you safe. So all you need to do is seek God and focus on His Word. Welcome back home, COP family. Wow, that feels good to say. We are back in live worship services and it's wonderful to be able to say, see you face to face. We have five weekend schedules. Saturday at 6 p.m., Sunday at 7.30 a.m., 10 a.m., 12.30 p.m., and 3 p.m. We'll finally get to worship, pray, and learn the Word all together again in God's house. Our services will still be on Facebook and YouTube. For more information and latest updates, keep checking our social media pages. COP family, let's go to the house of the Lord. Let's go to the house of the Lord. Welcome back home, COP family. 
To prioritize your safety, please listen closely as we remind you of these health and safety protocols required by the Department of Health and the IATF. All COP campuses will be thoroughly disinfected before members are allowed to come in. Before entering the COP premises, always wear a face mask. Please undergo temperature scanning. Use the disinfecting mats. While inside COP, use the sanitizing stations every 20 minutes. Take note of our social distancing markers around the campus. Always follow the signs and maintain the flow. Use the foot markers when queuing. Use the assigned stairs when going up or down. When finding your assigned seat or exiting the auditorium, please approach our friendly ushers and they will gladly assist you. Please remember that you can only sit on chairs with a red marker. A safety officer will always be present to assist you for any concerns regarding the mentioned protocols. We're doing our best to help keep you safe. So all you need to do is seek God and focus on His Word. Welcome back home, COP family. Wow, that feels good to say. We are back in live worship services and it's wonderful to be able to say, see you face to face. We have five weekend schedules. Saturday at 6 p.m., Sunday at 7.30 a.m., 10 a.m., 12.30 p.m., and 3 p.m. We'll finally get to worship, pray, and learn the Word all together again in God's house. Our services will still be on Facebook and YouTube. For more information and latest updates, keep checking our social media pages. COP family, let's go to the house of the Lord. Let's go to the house of the Lord.
Welcome back home, COP family. To prioritize your safety, please listen closely as we remind you of these health and safety protocols required by the Department of Health and the IATF. All COP campuses will be thoroughly disinfected before members are allowed to come in. Before entering the COP premises, always wear a face mask. Please undergo temperature scanning. Use the disinfecting mats. While inside COP, use the sanitizing stations every 20 minutes. Take note of our social distancing markers around the campus. Always follow the signs and maintain the flow. Use the foot markers when queuing. Use the assigned stairs when going up or down. When finding your assigned seat or exiting the auditorium, please approach our friendly ushers and they will gladly assist you. Please remember that you can only sit on chairs with a red marker. A safety officer will always be present to assist you for any concerns regarding the mentioned protocols. We're doing our best to help keep you safe. So all you need to do is seek God and focus on His Word. Welcome back home, COP family. Wow, that feels good to say. We are back in live worship services and it's wonderful to be able to say, see you face to face. We have five weekend schedules. Saturday at 6 p.m., Sunday at 7.30 a.m., 10 a.m., 12.30 p.m., and 3 p.m. We'll finally get to worship, pray, and learn the Word all together again in God's house. Our services will still be on Facebook and YouTube. For more information and latest updates, keep checking our social media pages. COP family, let's go to the house of the Lord. Let's go to the house of the Lord.
evening, everybody, and welcome to our Saturday 6 p.m. service here in Cathedral of Praise. We welcome all campuses, all branches, and everyone watching us live through live streaming. And let us not forget all those who are in the courts of the Lord. So now let's all stand up, and we will be starting the service with prayer, focusing on the open doors, protection, and restoration of everybody this coming 2022. So how do we pray, COP? Fervently and with joy. Let's all lift our hearts to the Lord, and let us all pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much again, O Lord. And we are here, Lord, with our hearts open wide, God, ready to worship you, ready, to God, to adore you, Lord. Thank you so much, O God, because we know that you are the God of twice as much. God, we pray, Lord, for provisions, O God, upon provisions, flowing, O God, to your people. God, we thank you because you are the one who will give us open doors of blessings that no man can shut, O God. You are the one who will guide us, O God, into this wonderful blessings, O Lord. We pray for our families to be blessed, O God in their we careers, Lord God, in their businesses, even, Lord God, in our young Thank people, you, Lord, give them, Lord God, open Jesus, Lord God, doors, Lord God, for them to be blessed. And God, we also pray, Lord, for the protection, Lord God, that you have given us, O Lord, all throughout this year, Lord God, all throughout this pandemic season. Thank you so much, Lord, for protecting, Lord, all of our families, our assets, Lord God, every one of us. And God, we thank you so much, O Lord, because it is you, Lord, who will continue to bless us, O God, with restoration, O Lord. For truly, God, there will be double restoration for all of your people. And God, we also pray for the double restoration of all our COP members who have been affected, Lord, by the typhoon, O Lord. And even, O God, our brothers and sisters, other churches, O God, in the Visayas region, Lord, who have been affected by this typhoon. God, we pray that you will help them, O Lord, that you will give them more hope, Lord, that comes from you, that there will be restoration, O Lord, that they will be rising up again, Lord, from all these things that affected them. And God, we pray that it is you, Lord, who will bless also, God, our family members with that. We also pray, Lord God, for growth upon growth, Lord God, in our local missions group, group Lord God. Lord, in Jensan, Lord, in Alokos Norte. God, we pray for more souls to be saved. We pray, Lord God, for more leaders, Lord God, and even go groups, oh Lord, to be given birth. We also pray, Lord God, for growth, Lord, in our international mission school group, Lord God, in Singapore, Lord, in Jeddah, in Saudi Arabia, oh Lord. It is you, God, who will give us also opportunities for the gospel to be preached. Lord, we pray for boldness upon boldness, oh God, for your word, oh God, to be preached, Lord, for all those people there. And God, we also pray, Lord, for all, oh God, our branches, oh God, all in this country. God, we pray for more branches to be open. We pray, Lord God, for more altars on the earth to be built. And we pray, Lord God, that it is you who will give us more pastors, Lord God, that will move, Lord God, the gospel, Lord, in every parts of the country. And God, we thank you, Lord, because we know that you are our faithful Father. You will never leave us alone. You will never forsake us, O God. You will always be there for us. Even, O God, this coming 2022, we know, Lord, that your hand will be upon us, O God. We know, Lord God, that we will be well provided for and we will be protected also, God. We will be guided by your holy presence, O God. And we know, Lord, that all things will work out for the good of those who love you, Lord. And we know, God, that as we continue to serve you, as we continue to live with clean hands and clean hearts, O God, we will grow stronger and stronger, O God. We will have favor upon favor, blessings upon blessings, O God, opportunities upon opportunities, Lord. And everything of this is possible because of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus is the light of this world, and the unfolding of his word gives light. Jesus is the Christ.
not a way, a truth, and one way of life. At COP, we know that like the apostles, we are to preach the gospel publicly and from house to house. It is a privilege to be in your homes sharing the gospel. At COP, we know a pastor is to teach the Word of God, enabling us to live lives that please the Lord. At COP, we know we are to preach the gospel to the poor, bringing them to what Jesus called life and life more abundantly. At COP, we heal the sick in Jesus' name, and our God is with us even to the end of the age. At COP, we know that the message is the gospel. We love it, we live it, and we preach it. It is the good news, and it is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. Amen. At COP, our eyes are on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We don't worship worship, we don't worship fellowship, we worship Jesus. At COP, we know that we have been called by God to be priests. We are to serve Him. We don't live in our own little world. We serve Him fervently until every lost person is found. We will build 200 churches across our land and across the world in the next 20 years. At COP, we know every member has been given the Great Commission, so we joyfully work while it is yet day, seeing people born again, baptized in water, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and learning to live for God. At COP, we know that we are to bear fruit and not to gather fruit. There is no shortage of people that need to hear the gospel. Our joy is to go to the harvest field and then bring the harvest field to the Lord. At COP, we know we are to fill His house with His praise. We praise the Lord. We praise Him for who He is and what He does. If it's not about Him, it's not praise. At COP, we know that the tithe is not about obedience to the law. It is before the law, during the law, and even Jesus taught tithing. It is our joy to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse to the Lord. At COP, we know prosperity is about trusting our Heavenly Father for everything we need. No fear of debt, no fear of poverty, no fear of people. Our Father is our provider. At COP, we know that Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father. That means that we are part of a great family of God across this world. When one part of that family needs help, it is our role freely give as we have freely received. At COP, we know God's grace abounds to us, teaching us to say no to sin and to work hard for Him.
Amen. Well, good evening to all of our wonderful campuses, branches in the parking lot of the Lord, al fresco in the tent, and those of us also joining us at home online by live streaming. Thank you, everyone, for being a part of our Saturday night service. If tonight is your first time or you have been here before, pretty please do help us out by making sure that you maintain social distancing as you come in, come forward, and exit. Please also help us out by making sure that you fill out your contact tracing form as we work hard to follow government guidelines and regulations. For those of you who are here tonight who do have any prayer requests, it would be a joy, honor, and privilege for our pastors to be able to pray for you. Please make sure you write down those prayer requests. Come on down to the front or the aisles in the balcony. Please do maintain social distancing as you do so. And our ushers and SPS would be more than happy to help you out. So let's all head back to main campus tonight. As we continue with our worship of the Lord, last week, Pastor taught, one of the scriptures he taught was from Job 19, uh, 17, 9 in the New Living Translation. Let's read it together. The righteous keep moving forward, and those with clean hands become stronger and stronger. And Pastor taught us that what do the righteous do? They keep moving forward. forward. Right. So let's sing his sermon tonight.
in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Wherever his presence is, there's life. Yes. When he walks among his people, there's life. Amen. There's miracles, there's healing. Yes. I know it's still a little hard for us to lay hands on people, but it's not hard for Jesus to lay hands on people. That's right. Jesus does not need social distancing. He's not bound by this world. I want you just to lift your hands before the Lord. If you need healing right now, just receive it. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, healing. Yes, Lord. Healing and strength flow within yes. your people. Yes, Jesus. Father, for the seniors that have been locked down for so long, Lord, as their days are, so let their strength be. Let strength flow back into their bodies again. Let every bit of sickness be gone from your people's bodies. Let recovery and health, full, full restoration of health flow in your people, Father. Amen. Oh, I thank you for it, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Bo Oh, we receive you. We receive it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Well, look around at everybody and say, I'm so glad to see you. You may be seated. Just a couple of quick things to share with you before we get started tonight. Many in our uh, many of our members have, this has been a rough couple of years. I don't know any other way to say it. We've had a lot of people go to be with the Lord in the last couple of years. Not all of them from COVID, but some from COVID. Families have not been able to do the inurnments of their families because the rest of their family couldn't travel. So this has been a, a very busy inurnment season as we families are able to come out and get together again. Now, because of that, many of our families ask us, Pastor, could we please return to the, the 60,000 for serenity? We said, yes, we can do that, uh, ending December 31st. And then people came to us, and many of you contacted your connect group leaders and said, could we please ask that it be extended? We met with our leadership last Sunday night, and the answer is yes. So we will be extending the 60,000 serenity one-time payment until the end of January. All right, so that will be available. We want to make sure all of our people are taken care of, we know that many of the other columbariums and the cemeteries are jacking up prices. Uh, I will tell you at one point during this lockdown, I actually thought we'll go down to the radio transmitter site in Batangas and build a, a, a what do you call the things, that, a crematorium. Because we had families that were paying 100, 125,000 to have their loved ones taken care of because the prices just, they just jacked up the prices on everything. But brothers and sisters, we got through that. We're moving forward. And everybody said? So that is available for those of you that are wanting it. And please let me also remind you, please get your giving receipts. You can go to online and, and do the QR code. You can fill out one of the sheets of paper in one of the lobbies. And we'll take care of that right away. Would you open your Bibles today to Matthew chapter 2? Matthew 2. Now let me remind all of you and all of our members at home that next weekend is candlelight communion on Friday night, one service. It's going to be at 7 o'clock. Pastor Summer, why so late? Because the government has changed the rules this year, and Christmas Eve day is still a full working day. All right, so because people are having to work, we're, we're not doing candlelight communion until 7 p.m., now, because it's 7 p.m. and because we can only do 50% capacity and we can't clean things that quickly in between without going really, really late, we're going to do a second candlelight communion, not on the same night, but on Saturday night. Now, also for the drive-in services on Saturday morning, Christmas Day and Saturday morning, uh, New Year's Day, those will only be at South Campus, not at our other campuses, only be at South Campus. We'll be running a reduced staff. I will still be there preaching because the folks ask for it. And you're just going to have to understand, those folks in the drive-in down there on Saturday morning, you know, if you ask how many of you have been here since we started, everybody honks their horn. 
Okay, ever since we started to drive in, they've been there, and I'm not going to let them down. All right, so I'll be there Christmas morning. I'll be there New Year's morning, but we will run a little reduced staff. We won't be doing it here at main campus or east campus or north campus, but on Christmas morning and on New Year's morning, we will still have a drive-in service at south campus. Matthew chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Every year at this time as we get ready for candlelight communion, I talk to you about our Christmas gifts for Jesus. Last week we passed out boxes. If you'd like to get yours and you've not gotten it yet, you can get it when you come to the altar to bring your tithe and seed before the Lord, or you can get it from an usher after the service. But each year at this time I prepare you and talk to you about what our Christmas gifts for Jesus are all about. It's always fascinating to me about people who want to be upset about it, because to be honest, at Christmas, we celebrate the birth of our Savior. And we give gifts to everybody else, but we're celebrating his birthday. How many of you like to receive a present on your birthday? Would you raise your hand? Would you raise your hand? Okay, we, we want people to celebrate our day, Diba. Well, I think we should celebrate his day and not just give gifts to everybody else. There's something that has happened in the world that... As a young man confused me, and I'm still a young man, but I'm still confused also. You go to nations that don't even believe in Jesus, and they celebrate Christmas. They, they celebrate the birth of the Savior. It, it is like something has happened supernaturally into this world, and people's attitudes change, and hope begins to flow in people's hearts again, and people begin to understand what it was all about. It's like a beautiful testimony once a year that has permeated every culture of the world. The only other time I ever see in Scripture or any other place where the whole world will give gifts to each other, <laughs> forgive me, is in the Great Tribulation. When the Antichrist finally succeeds in killing the two prophets of God, the two witnesses in the temple, they send gifts to one another to celebrate. But those are the only two things. It's a beautiful thing to bring a special gift to Jesus at Christmas. And everybody said? Verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Now when did they come? We don't know. You know, tradition has this, and Greek Orthodox tradition has that, and Catholic tradition has this, but we don't really know when these wise men came. We know it was within a two-year period because Herod said, kill all the children under the age of two. But we don't know exactly the time that these men came. They came saying, verse 2, where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned all the wise men secretly, and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, going into the what? So they didn't come to the manger. This is, this is well after the birth of Jesus. They didn't come to the manger. Jesus was now in a house. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now again, we don't know when they came, but we recognize some beautiful principles of giving that these men illustrate to our lives. First of all, when these men came, it required effort. It required what? They had traveled a far distance, from, at least from the area of Babylon. Now, when, when Nehemiah took that journey, and he had children with him in the entourage, it took him four months. How many months? 
Historians tell us that at best pace, they could have made it in two months if they were really traveling fast. It would have been a difficult journey, maybe made a little easier if they traveled along the Euphrates River, but whatever journey they took, whatever route they took, there was going to be a good portion of that was across dry, ugly, barren desert. They had to make an effort. They had to make a what? Now, brothers and sisters, please forgive me, but I don't, I don't understand this modern concept that's being propagated by people today that we have to make it convenient for the people to give. I don't want it to be convenient for you to give. It should be something that you want to do. I, I didn't hear you. I didn't hear you. This is why all during the lockdown for almost two years, you never saw us raise money online. You never saw us talk about giving online. We never mentioned anything like that. We said, listen, if you can't get to church, just hold on to your tithe and seed. And when you can get to God's house, then you bring the tithe and you bring the seed to God's house. There is an effort that should be made. Everybody say an effort. Now, Friday night I was teaching the congregation on one of the ways we honor God and one of the ways they dishonored God. In Malachi chapter 1, God really got after the priests because the spiritual leaders, the priests were teaching people, it is burdensome, it is wearisome to have to bring the offering to God. And God said, how can you so dishonor me like that? How can you teach people that it's, it's a burden, it's, a, it's a, a wearisome thing to bring the offerings to me? Where is the honor, he said, that is due my name? So brothers and sisters, we don't simply just send money. We, we don't just go online and pay it like a Morelco bill or pay it like a, a Manilad bill or pay it like the, the credit card bill. This is not a bill that we pay in life. The gifts that we bring to the Lord, the tithe that we return to the Lord is not some duty, it's not some dues that we are paying. It is an act of worship to the Lord. And God wants us to bring it to him. It's a matter of showing honor to God. Secondly, the Magi had to have an act of faith. Now you'll say, well, Pastor, these people were so wealthy. We see by the gifts they brought, these people were so wealthy, it didn't take a lot of faith. Oh, yes, it did. Because not only did they have to take the journey, they had to stand before Herod, who believed that he was king of the Jews, and say, Herod, We've come to worship the one born king of the Jews. And forgive me, Herod could have killed these men. So it had to be a step of faith. God had to warn them not to return to Herod, Matthew 2, 12. Thirdly, look at verse 11. And going into the house, they saw the child and Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures. Everybody say then. What came before the offering? Worship. It wasn't just about paying some silly bill. What came first was worship. They came to worship the king. The offering is a part of the worship, yes, but first the whole desire of their heart was worship. Fourthly, they gave with total generosity. Then, verse 11, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now look at that for a moment. These men, according to their culture and custom of the time, carried the money that they used for every day in a small leather pouch, like I used to have for marbles when I was a little kid, a small leather pouch that was wrapped and tied to their belt. They didn't just open their pouch and give Jesus a few coins or a few pieces of gold or silver. They opened their treasures. They went back to their caravan and they opened their treasures. And what they brought Jesus is fascinating. The three smallest, the three smallest containers of wealth that you could bring. They didn't bring him silver. Silver takes up a lot of space. It was not worth near what gold was worth. They brought gold, they brought frankincense, and they brought myrrh. Three things that would store wealth that were small and could travel with. Everybody say, easy to store wealth. 
very mobile. Why? Because the first thing that was going to happen is the Savior had to go down and spend 10 years in exile in Egypt so that Herod could not kill him. So all of the finances for that trip were taken care of. And most scholars believe that this endowment of Jesus as a king, and this is what it was, it was the, the endowment of a new king. This endowment of Jesus as a king is what he lived on his entire life. Did you notice in Scripture Jesus never received an offering? Have you ever noticed that? Never received an offering. It's like God was saying, I'm not going to receive anything from you. I take care of myself. He never received an offering. He was endowed with this endowment of a king. And scholars believe that this is what was really happening when Jesus looked at John and said, Behold your mother, and mom, behold your son. There was a legal transfer that took place in which now John took over what was left of that wealth and used it to care for his mama until the day she died. Leaving Jerusalem and traveling to Ephesus, and scholars say that she actually passed away in Ephesus, which was the great church of the world at that time. So this was an incredible gift. It was not a, a small gift. It was a gift of great generosity. So I challenge you, as we move into candlelight communion next week, may I ask a question of you? Has God been good to you these last two years? How many of you have God's been good to? Would you raise your hand? Then bring something from a treasure. Bring, open your treasures and bring a gift to the king. Just say, Lord, it's your birthday. But more than that, Lord, I'm bringing a thanksgiving offering from my family for how you have taken care of me and taken care of our family and provided for our family over these last two years. And everybody said? All right, that's my offering thought tonight. Would you put your tithe in the red envelopes, please? Put your seed in the blue envelopes. In the balconies, we have the baskets out, out in the parking lots, and in our alfresco services, we have the ushers there. Those of you in the auditoriums, come. Bring your tithe and seed before the Lord.
amen and amen. If I could ask everyone to please stand up with the most amazing ushers in the entire universe to please help us out. Let us all stretch our hands to our tithe, our seed, our vows, and those awesome daily manna bottles, and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come tonight so thankful and grateful, Lord, for this year. Lord, we have seen your faithfulness in our life. We have seen, Lord God, that you have been there through all of the ups and the downs, Lord God, of this season. Lord, we also thank you that we get to come and be in your house tonight to worship you, give you glory, honor, and praise. Lord, we return to you tonight that which belongs to you, the seed we are sowing, the vows we are fulfilling. We pray and ask, Father, that you receive it in your mighty name. And we thank you for a wonderful, Lord God, harvest that's on its way. Lord, with more seed to sow. We thank you, Lord God, for a great outpouring, Lord, of the Holy Spirit upon our finances, that we will look for the restoration, Lord God, that will take place, that we will see increase and we will see retention, Lord God, next year as well. Lord, we thank you as we get to come tonight and worship you with our tithes and our offerings. We praise you for your goodness and your faithfulness in our life. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Please do be seated and let's turn our attention to the screen for this week at COP. This week at COP, Christmas is in the air and we want to thank you COP for your generosity again this Christmas for our feeding children. With a goal of 1,500 gifts to give away, we have reached 1,367 toys, shoes, and slippers. This is our last weekend to receive gifts as the gift giving will start on Tuesday the 21st in our Naik Feeding, Wednesday the 22nd in our Aroma and Happy Land site, Thursday the 23rd at the Katmon site, and also at the Payata site. Thank you, COP, for the pure joy you show as you share blessings with these children. Thank you for your heart for God. Thank you for being blessed to be a blessing. This week at COP, our Christian Arts Department is almost ready to bring to you our Candlelight Communion 2021. We had a wonderful face-to-face -face rehearsal last Sunday night, and the music is sounding ready. We do hope to see you on December 24 at 7 p.m., or December 25 at 6 p.m. in all campuses except Kawi. It's the most beautiful service. Meanwhile, CAD held an online Christmas fellowship last Saturday, combined with our 32nd annual Chocolate Awards. Congratulations, Joyful North Choir, for being our CAD Ministry of the Year for the second year running. This week at COP, our Sir Lord Cars and Rangers held a combined Christmas celebration with the theme of Recap, Remembering Christ's Amazing Promises. Each team displayed their custom-made virtual parole and testimonies were shared. This week at COP, we rejoice with Heaven's Angels for souls being saved. The mighty men in uniform saw 215 military souls saved. Attorney Beth Gonzalez praises God for 181 students who were saved as she personally shared the gospel with them along with Pastor Matt, Pastor James, and Pastora Alex. What a wonderful Christmas gift for these young people to know the Lord. This week at COP Go 200, did you know? Not only do we have wonderful online Bible studies going on around the world and some awesome baby branches sprouting up, but we now also have a total of 17 satellite churches meeting weekly. Three from Isabella, three from Lawag, four from Davao, two from Olongapo, one from Bataan, one from Batangas, and one from COP Hawaii. We also have one from our Pampanga campus and one from East Campus. In so many ways, the gospel is progressing, and we say thank you, Lord. This week at COP, we have a new and simplified QR code. You can get this code by taking note of it right now, right here. Or you can get it at any of our COP campus lobbies. It's a much shorter form, easier to fill out, and much better for our contact tracing. And everybody said, Amen. This week at COP, we praise God for the harvest He's pouring out on our families. The Ridon family dedicated their debt-free house. The Sonico family dedicated their house and lot and opened a go group too. 
The Sanchez family dedicated their food business named Sunshine and dedicated two big trucks for their business. They also opened a go group in their company. The Panaguitan family dedicated their expanded business in a better location. The Lavore family dedicated their house and lot, testifying of the transference of wealth in the hard times. The Ladinas family dedicated their house. Arvin and Kathy dedicated their clothing business. The Falcotello family dedicated their condo. The Vargas family dedicated their milk tea business with two people saved. The Mancia family dedicated both a half hectare of land and a new grain business, a double dedication. Paolo and Carla dedicated their dream house. Mike and Ella dedicated their Honda Mobilio. The Garcia family praises God for their Honda PRV. The Valencia family dedicated their Ford Ranger. The Pangilinan family dedicated their new vehicle. And you know, COP, that every dedication has a story. But let's take time for just one. The Soriano family of South is praising God for a double dedication as last August a flood devastated their area. Though their house was miraculously not touched, their car outside was totaled. After that, they rented a car every Saturday so as not to miss church. Also, Brother Pierre lost his job during the pandemic. Now, God is crowning the year with his bounty as they dedicated their new Honda City hatchback, their new motorcycle, and Brother Pierre got a new job just 15 minutes from their house and with a better salary. Truly, our God restores. Finally, coming up at COP, our 30-day challenge. Are you ready? Let's start January together, COP, filling our hearts richly with the Word of God. Let's read the entire New Testament together in one month as we start on a productive 2022. Just choose which translation you will use, get the reading guide from any of our online sites or any pastor. Happy reading and God bless. It has been another great week at COP. God has been good to us, amen? Now that said, we've all been watching Cebu. It's hard to get any news out. Internet is down. Electricity is down. They're saying maybe electricity will be down two, three, maybe four weeks. The airport is closed. They're saying the airport will probably be closed at least a couple of weeks. Um, we're trying to figure out what we can do to help. Now, we're working with Pastor Fritz, our campus pastor, or our, our branch pastor there in Cebu. But I would like to remind you that he has a baby being born first, first week, I think, first week of January. 18th of January. And it's first baby, so who knows when that baby's going to hatch. Now, what I'd like to ask is that all of you just be a little ready Maybe over this next week, we'll be calling some of you, and, and, and I don't want to take families, but yeah, some of the young men who are, everybody say, single young men. If we can get some of the single young men that will say, I want to go down and help a little bit. We have members of the church there that lost their roofs. Uh, there are churches that have lost their roofs. There are families that have no food. They have no water. Uh, we just got a whole new shipment of our, of our daily manna packs in uh, yesterday. In fact, our rangers unloaded them all day yesterday, and bless their hearts, they still showed up to set up the truck this morning. Uh, so we're, we're ready to go, but we're going to need some folks to help us. We had to figure out how to get things there. We had to figure out how to transfer money there with, you know, electricity down and internet down, how much banking is going to function. We've got to figure out how to do this, and we'll be working on that. So those of you who would like to volunteer, and I, I don't want husbands and wives, please. I, I want you to be with your kids. But some of the single young men, if you would like to go help, I, I don't promise you an easy trip. I promise you that you'll probably sleep on the floor of the church, and you will eat what we can eat, and we'll do what we can do. Uh, but if some of you single young men would like to help, we want to go and be a blessing to our Kababayan. God has been good to us as a church. I didn't hear you. We are blessed to be a blessing. All right. Would you open your Bibles, please, to Proverbs chapter 22, one last time. We're in a different season. For the last 22 months during this crazy lockdown, 
I have focused all of my teaching on encouraging you and helping you and how to stand. But you know what? We're coming out of this now. And we're no longer focused on healing and we're no longer focused on faith and we're no longer focused on being able to stand. Now we're focusing on moving forward in Jesus' name. And different seasons, different circumstances require application of different truths in the Scripture. And you look in, in Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3. Jesus laid out in Revelation 1 a beautiful picture of who he was. But then in Revelation 2 and Revelation chapter 3, to each of the seven churches of Asia, he didn't take that full revelation from Revelation 1. He took a piece of it. He said, now this is something that this church needs to get a hold of. And then the next church, this is, this is a part of me that this church. Different things had to be taught to different churches in different circumstances. Now, in our case, for the last two years, we focused on encouragement and we focus on learning to stand. But we have a group of people in the church that have really been devastated by this COVID-19 thing. Those of you who have jobs, those of you who are professionals, you had work from home. And please forgive me, it was a tremendous inconvenience. It was a pain in the neck. I get it. But you weren't devastated. You weren't wiped out. In fact, so many of you have come and said, Pastor, we've saved more money than we've ever saved before because we've had almost no expenses because we just work from home. And, you know, you put on a nice top when you sit in front of the Zoom and you wear your slippers and your house shorts the rest of the time and you don't have to pay transportation and you don't have to eat your food out. Everything just stays at home. But we have another group of people in the church, small businesses, people who worked in the tourism industry, people who owned restaurants, people who owned jeepneys. These people have been devastated by this thing. So please forgive me if I took last week and I take this study again this week, and I talk to you about a different kind of a theme. Hard times can destroy wealth, generational wealth, but hard times can also be a time when generational wealth can be built. Everybody say, the building of generational wealth. And for those of you who have been hurt, for those of you who have been wiped out, you've been devastated, what I want to teach you today is how to move forward again. Now last week I talked with you about reversing the losses. Step number one, you stop the losses. You quit blaming yourself. You, you quit, you know, okay, I made bad decisions. Okay, I did wrong things, and, and I'm suffering for it. Proverbs 22, 3. The prudency danger and hides himself, but the simple keep going and suffer for it. Okay, this suffering is my fault. I'm going to bow and endure it. God doesn't want you to endure it. We said God is a God of mercy. I didn't hear you. So if, even, if you, even if everything, everything is your fault, you come to God. And you ask God for mercy. And God is a God of mercy. Secondly, we said we stop the bad, risky adventures. Thirdly, we said we move out of an environment of injustice. Then we said, listen, the next thing you have to do, step two, is rebuild your foundations. And I love that passage in Matthew 7, verses 24 to 27. Because it not only teaches us that foundations are obedience to the word, it teaches us that it's obedience to the word you have heard. Everybody say, I have heard. This is why a baby believer and a 50-year-in-the-faith seasoned believer can stand equally strong in the storm because it is not what you know that makes you stand. It's the obedience to what you know that makes you stand. So a baby believer may have only a little bit of knowledge but if they are living in obedience to the little bit of knowledge they have, they will still stand against the storm. And everybody said? We said survival of the storm requires that a life built upon the word. We have to get disobedience out of our lives. And then we looked at Isaac as our illustration again and saw three attitudes of his heart that destroyed obedience. And he was leaving the land. First, the insecurity because he feel like he didn't belong and God had to speak to him and say, this is your land and the land of your children and your children's children after you. Secondly, he had to overcome the fear of people. And thirdly, he had to overcome his temporary attitude and begin to park in the land. Now, I want to pick up from there 
And I want to begin to teach you some practical steps to move forward and rebuild your family business. Now you often hear us talk about the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. The scriptures are clear about it. Proverbs 13, 22. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but a sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 26. For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner, to the who? To the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting only to give it to the one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after the wind. Now I want you to notice the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. But too many believers, they get a hold of that revelation and they don't understand how it works. They think that if they will just sit around in their house and pray in the Holy Ghost, that God will take money out of the bank accounts of rich people and stick it into their bank account. And I, I mean, I can remember sitting down with a person one day and they said, I'm waiting for the transfer of wealth into my accounts. I said, what transfer? Who, who owes you money? Oh, nobody. The, but the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. I'm waiting for God to transfer it into my account. I laughed at them. I said, it, it's never, never going to happen. Now, there's two things you have to understand about the transfer of wealth. Number one, it happens in the bad times. It happens in the what times? The transfer of the wealth of the wicked to the righteous does not happen in the good times. Every place in Scripture that we see a transfer of wealth, it happens in the bad times. And the second thing you have to understand about it is it happens by a business transaction. It happens by a what? It doesn't happen by supernaturally God just taking money from somebody's bank account and sticking it into your bank account. It happens by a business transaction. Think with me to great transfers of wealth. The transfer of wealth of people who knew that seven bad years were coming and ignored it. All the wealth of every human being in Egypt transferred to the, the Pharaoh under Joseph's control in seven bad years. But it transferred as Joseph sold them food. And as he sold them food, first they paid with money, then they paid with their livestock, their flocks and their herds. Then they paid with their land. Then they paid by selling themselves into slavery. All of the wealth transferred by business transactions. Think of the wealth of the wicked that transferred in Isaac's generation that we're going to study today. It transferred as Isaac planted and reaped a hundredfold and began to sell that food. And all of those flocks and herds, as we'll see today, transferred to him. Think of the transfer of wealth from Laban's family to Joseph or to Jacob. It transferred as he bred the sheep week by week, day by day, month by month. It transferred as he did business. Everybody said agricultural business. Now, beloved, you're going to have to understand that in the hard times, yes, there's tremendous danger. And yes, please, and I don't say this to bring any hurt or pain, some of you have been devastated. I mean, people that I have known for generations, people I've known for decades, not generations, for decades, they built up jeepney businesses because that's what they were good at. And all of a sudden, COVID locks down all the jeepneys, and then the government says, oh, we're going to change the transportation, and we're not going to have jeepneys anymore. And they're just, everything they've invested in, everything they've done is wiped out. But there's also tremendous opportunity. But wealth will only transfer as we work. I didn't hear you. Now let's start. Some practical steps to rebuild your family businesses and rebuild your family wealth if it has been wiped out in this thing. First of all, you must take a step of faith to do business again. Everybody say, make investments and do business. Verse 12, Genesis 26. And Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. The Lord blessed him. And the man became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. Now notice Isaac sowed. Everybody say Isaac. It didn't say his workers sowed. Isaac sowed. I showed you last week that all of those slaves that he had had before, all of the men servants and maid servants that he had inherited from his father, those people are all gone. 
That's why he's afraid for his life. Later on, we'll see in verse 14, he again begins, as he grows wealth again, he again begins to hire workers. He begins to have men servants and maid servants in verse 14. But at this point in time, he's down to almost nothing. And he sows himself. He did the work himself. Now, now please hear me on this and listen carefully. You cannot delegate the blessings of God upon your life. God said he would bless the work of your hands, not the hands of somebody you hired. You cannot delegate anointing. You cannot delegate blessing. That is something that comes to your life. You can't say, oh, God, bless the work of their hands because they're doing my work. It doesn't work like that. God blessed Potiphar's household because Joseph was there. When Joseph left, the blessings are gone. God blessed Laban because Jacob was there. When Jacob was gone, the blessings were gone. The blessings of God, the anointing of God, rests upon a person. Everybody say, on me. Say it again. Now notice, the Lord blessed him. I taught you that last week. The Lord blessed him. Did not bless his employees. The Lord blessed him. Him. Now, for some of you, losing all of those employees may be one of the greatest blessings that ever happened to your life. Oh, yes, Pastor, because I don't have payroll. No, because now you're going to do it yourself. And that anointing that flows through your life is going to bring blessing. Are you getting this? Sometimes, please forgive me, beloved. Sometimes it's better to do it yourself. God blessed him, not his employees, him. God will bless you, not your employees. God will bless you. God blesses the work of your hands, not all the people's hands that work for you. See, sometimes Christians, get when they start getting involved in, in family businesses and they start hiring people, they don't understand the less work you do yourself diminishes the anointing that flows through your life. Are we still here? Are we still here? So sometimes coming down to nothing again is a good thing because all of a sudden you have to do it all. All of a sudden the anointing that is upon your life, the blessing that is upon your life, the hand of God that is upon your life, all of a sudden that brings all the growth to the business again because God's blessing you. Are you getting this? Now, take it a little farther. Six truths about the investment that he made. First of all, it was an investment that was a step of faith toward self-sufficiency. Toward what? There was no food to eat. He's run out. He's in a minority. He's a foreigner. What happens to the foreigners when there's no food? They come last. People are hoarding. He says, all right, I got to eat. I'm going to plant some food. Self-sufficiency. It's a step of faith investment toward number one, self-sufficiency. Number two, it's a step of faith investment that required that he change his lifestyle. All of his life, he'd been a herdsman. He'd taken care of sheep and goats. And he was very good at it. He'd been raised in it his whole life. And now for the first time in his life, he's a farmer. He's a what? He'd never farmed before. He'd never planted crops before. He had to learn something new. He had to adjust his lifestyle. Now, for some of you, that's going to be a big adjustment. It's going to get you out of your comfort zone. You're going to have to learn something new. Thirdly, it was a step of faith investment that tied him to the land. Now, remember, God spoke to him to stay in the land. He stayed there in Gerar a long time. That's how he lost everything. 
but he still wasn't tied to the land. He, I showed you last week how he was focused on for a while rather than focused on stay. But when he, after a long time, planted crops, the blessings began to flow. It was an investment that tied him to the land. Everybody say, tied him to the land. He didn't have one foot looking to go to America or Canada. Excuse me, don't want to be rude, but excuse me. He was tied to the land. Everybody say, tied to the land. Fourthly, it was a step of faith investment that was so where the risk was so high that he had no competition. It was a step of faith investment where the risk was so high there was no competition. I mean, please, you don't plant in a time of famine. Famine means there's no rain. You don't plant when there's no rain. You don't plant in a drought. You don't plant in a famine. He had no competition. But now listen to me carefully. When you make this type of a high-risk thing, it has to be done in obedience, not in presumptive faith. It has to be obedient faith, not presumptive faith and not imitated faith. Presumptive faith is, I'm going to do this and God has to bless me. God doesn't have to do anything. We obey God. God does not obey us. I didn't hear you. This is what I was teaching you last night about honoring God and things. We, we walk humbly with our God. We don't say, okay, God, I did this. Now you have to bless it. No, no, that's presumptive faith. You have to learn obedient faith. Well, I saw this other person do this. That's imitated faith. First sermon I ever heard Dr. Cho preach, 1978, young man. He preached a sermon called Real Versus Imitated Faith, and he told the story of Moses standing at the sea, and he held out his staff because God told him to. And the waters parted, and the people of Israel passed over on dry ground. And Pharaoh saw all this happen. He goes, well, if Moses can do it, I can do it too. That's imitated faith. He got out in the middle, and he drowned. You don't do things because you see other people do it. You don't do things and then tell God to bless you. When you take these high-risk things by faith, it has to be obedient faith. You are doing what God told you to do. Fifthly, Isaac made a step of faith investment that was for a necessity product, not a luxury product. He planted food. He planted what? Now, now brothers and sisters, please forgive me. In times of famine, people don't spend money on luxuries. People don't spend money on discretionary spending. In hard times, people only spend money on what they have to spend money on. Everybody say, necessities. Forgive me, during the last two years, did you splurge or did you hold on to your money? I didn't hear you. Now, you have to understand, every human being thinks like that. You don't go out and throw money around and, and waste money on things during hard times. You, you buy what the family needs. He did not go out and start a Mercedes-Benz dealership in Garar. He planted food. He made an investment that could be sold as a necessity. It was something that everybody needed. Sixth. He made a step of faith investment. Now, this is going to sound very economical for a minute, so don't get upset with me. He's, he made a step of faith investment where the profit margin created by the local product competed very favorably against the price of a high-priced high import. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. All the food for these people was coming in from the Nile River Delta, what we call Goshen, hundreds of kilometers across a desert. So by the time they raised that food, harvested the food, put it in carts, and drug it across the desert, by the time it got to Gerar, it didn't look very good 
Number two, you had shrinkage because of rotting and things like that and rats and mice and bugs and everything else. You had shrinkage. And in addition to shrinkage, you had transportation cost. Now, Isaac is planting. His food looks fresh and new. Everybody say, looks better, tastes better. <laughs> like uh, attorney Aideen, they were down looking at a new piece of property. One of our members is donating us a beautiful property in Infanta Quezon to build a church building. And she was down there looking at the property this week. And she said, Pastor, for 300 pesos, I got two big lapu-lapu and three small lapu-lapu for 300 pesos. Now, how many of you have ever eaten fresh fish in the province? Does it taste better than Manila? Yeah, okay. So you got that in mind, all right? Your, your, your food looks fresh and palatable because it was raised right there. There's no transportation cost. There's no shrinkage due to, to rotting and things on the journey. So he can sell his, his food at an even higher price than the import, but he probably didn't. But even if it was close to the price of the import, his is mostly profit and theirs is mostly expense. Now, beloved, in the days ahead, you're going to have to figure out, in the Philippines, we can compete against China. We can compete against the West. We can compete against Taiwan. I mean, we can make some beautiful stuff here. And you need to understand, there's no transportation costs. There's no shrinkage. There's no price of fuel raising the price of everything. This is a time when small businesses can compete, but you have to understand how to do it. So those are six investment strategies to recover in the hard times. Now take it a step farther. Are you learning? Strange sermons. Secondly, you're going to have to be willing to try again. Everybody say try again. Now remember with me, please. Before the famine hit, he's a wealthy man. Flocks and herds, Diba. You know? In the famine, flocks and herds die off because there's no water. Now when he starts selling the food, what do people pay him in? Flocks and herds. Verse 14. I'll start with verse 13. The Lord blessed him. The man became very rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. He had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants so that the Philistines envied him. You're going to have to understand that as God begins to rebuild the wealth of your family, he's probably going to give you some of the old back again. Everybody say, same things again. You'll be doing some of the same business you did before. And you say, but pastor, the environment has not changed. That's true. But you have changed. You are walking in obedience. And because you are walking in obedient faith, the hand of God's blessing is upon you. So don't be afraid to try again. Everybody say, don't be afraid to try again. Remember the two greatest catches of fish that Peter ever saw in his life. One before he was called to the full-time ministry, and the second later when he was returning to the full-time ministry. Both of those were after a night of failure, and Jesus said, let's try again. And then he had great success. So don't be afraid to try again. Everybody say, don't be afraid of the old business. Third practical thing I want you to see. You need to practice patience. You need to practice what? Hebrews 12, or his, Hebrews 6 verse 12. He said, so that you may not be sluggish. He said, I don't want you to move slow. He said, I want you to get some, get some quick movement in here. He said, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. 
Through faith and what was the second word? Patience. Who through faith and patience inherit the promise. There is nothing that is going to happen in your life instantly. Notice in verse 12 and 13, he became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. Everybody say, that's progress, not instantaneous. Now, beloved, there is no such thing as a get-rich-quick scheme in the Bible. Proverbs 13, 11 says, wealth gained hastily will dwindle. You start putting together wealth in a hurry, get-rich-quick schemes, wealth gained hastily will dwindle. But whoever gathers little by little makes it grow. Proverbs 28, verse 20, a faithful man will abound with blessing. What kind of a man? Just a faithful person, just always faithful. But whoever hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. Don't be in a hurry. Faith and patience receives the promise. Everybody say, don't be in a hurry. Say it again. Can I give you a little bit more? This is the hard one. Not only must you practice patience, you must practice persistence. And you must practice persistence in the face of the envy that will manifest in the hard times when you succeed. Now I want you to look at verse 14. He had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants, so that the Philistines envied him. What did the Philistines do? Envy is probably the most destructive emotion in Scripture. And envy is a dominant attitude in the hard times. These flocks and herds used to belong to those people, but they sold them to Isaac for food. So now they saw Isaac with their flocks and herds. They thought, those are ours. But no, they weren't theirs. Isaac had bought them from them at a fair price for food. Laban's sons were envious of Jacob. But you know what? They could have gone out and worked hard in the fields and raised lots of sheep and goats, but they didn't. Instead, they said, everything our father had, Jacob has stolen. Jacob didn't steal anything. He was just a faithful man. He was a man of faith. Everybody say faith and faithful. Now, beloved, please forgive me, but nobody likes success in the hard times. People get very envious. And the word here for envy, it is a strong word. The Hebrew word here for envy means to get heated, to become excited, to be annoyed, to be tormented, hurt, rebellious, burn with zeal, to be furious. Your torment, your success torments people. Everybody say, my success torments people. Everybody say, my success makes people furious. Everybody say, my success makes people annoyed. That's what envy means. These people were annoyed. They were furious. They were tormented every time they saw him. They were tormented by those flocks and herds. And then what did they do? They wanted to destroy it. The Philistines, verse 15, stopped and filled up the earth, all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father. Now look at what these guys did. It was his father who dug this well. And they said, you know what, we're going to fill it up. You're not going to have water for the flocks and herds you bought from us when you sold us food. If we can't have them, you're not either. See, envy is a scorched earth attitude. Envy is a what? Everybody say scorched earth attitude. If you read the history books, 
in the Civil War in America, when the North invaded the South, at the end of the war, they burned it to the ground. And you look at it, you go, why would they do that? I mean, why would they do that? They were cup of iron, but why would they do that? The North were envious of the South because before the Civil War, the majority of wealth in America was in the South. And the Northeasterners wanted all the wealth to be up there. They did it again. It's called the Tulsa, Oklahoma riots. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, I didn't even know this growing up. I never saw it in a history book. I just, I just learned it recently and could not believe what happened. There used to be a second Wall Street in America called the Black Wall Street. And it was all for black people. And it was an extremely wealthy situation right in the center of the United States. You just wonder how wealthy would America be today if they had two Wall Streets. But white people got jealous. And they burned it to the ground and killed so many of the black millionaires. They destroyed the black Wall Street. Everybody say envy. See, envy is always a scorched earth situation. If I can't have it, you can't have it either, I'll destroy it. That's what envy is like. And these people looked at Isaac and said, you know what? If we can't have those flocks and herds, you're not either, we'll kill them. We'll stop up the water and we'll kill them. Now, brothers and sisters, you're going to have to understand, this is just what people get like in the hard times. This is why you often hear me say, never flash your cash. In the hard times, low profile in Jesus' name. I can't hear you. So what did Isaac do? Well, he moved on. Verse 17, Isaac departed from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. And Isaac dug again the wells that had been dug in the days of Abraham his father, which the Philistines had stopped up after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the names his father had given them. Verse 19. But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of water, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water's ours. So he called the name of the well Essek, because they contended with him. All right? They stopped up one set of wells. Now they drive him off from another set of wells that, again, he goes through all the effort of digging. They didn't dig these wells. He dug the wells. Then in verse 21, then he dug another well, and they quarreled over it also, and he called it Sitna. Everybody say, he had to keep moving. Then he, then he moved on from there and dug another well, verse 22. And they did not quarrel over it, so he called his name Rehoboth, saying, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. Now here's the lesson I want you to get from this. The way you handle envy in other people's hearts forgive the use of the word but the way you handle it is social distancing <laughs> everybody says social distancing say give some space so they can't see it he just kept moving farther and farther and farther back into the promised land brother john preaches a great sermon on that he just keeps moving farther and farther back into the promised land and putting space between him and these people who envied him. Now, beloved, you're going to have to do some of this. As God blesses you, and God will bless you, and everybody said? Yes. And God will restore twofold everything that has been lost, and everybody said? Yes. But as God does this, and there are relatives, and there are friends, and there are people who aren't such relatives or friends, and they envy you, and they try to destroy what you have, and they're just nasty, they're tormented, they're annoyed, they're furious about your blessings. The best thing to do is just have some social distancing. Everybody say, put some space. Say it again. So they don't see your new house. They don't see your car. They don't see your new TV set. They don't see that your family is doing well again. Everybody say, put some distance. Put some envy distancing. Okay, instead of social distancing, put some envy distancing. Now, what finally happened with Isaac was beautiful. In verses 26 to 31, when Abimelech went to him from Gerar with Ahuzuha, his advisor, and Philco, the commander of his army, 
Isaac said to him, why have you come to me, seeing that you hate me and have sent me away from you? He said, hey, listen, you people have made my life really, really difficult. <laughs> and then it's so funny. They said, we see plainly that the Lord has been with you. So we said, let us make a sworn pact between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant that you will do us no harm. Just as we have not touched you and have done you nothing but good and sent you away in peace. Excuse me? You've done me nothing but good? Excuse me? You tried to wipe out everything that God gave me. You tried to destroy all the blessings that God gave me. You've done me nothing but good? Excuse me? Of course it's not true. But now here's something I want to close with. I want you to notice, Isaac let these people back up. Everybody say back up. There comes a point when people realize we can't fight these, this person. We can't fight this family. God is with them and God is blessing them. There comes a point they figure it out. Unless they're just really parang bato, okay? Finally, they come to the point and they figure it out. And they want to come to you and say, we've always been good to you, we've always loved you, and you want to look at them and go, excuse me? You would have killed me in an instant. Excuse me? But let them back up. Everybody say, let them back up. He not only let them back up, he, put a, he gave them a beautiful dinner. They had a wonderful meal together. Everything is fine. Everything is wonderful. And then he let them go home, but he still kept his envy distancing. Everybody say, let them back up. Be sweet and kind to them. Everybody say, be sweet and kind to them. But keep the envy distancing and move on with life. Did you learn something today? Would you stand with me, please? Now, I've finished with what I believe God wanted me to teach you about recovering. Go back and download the sermons offline. Listen to these things again and again. Get them in your insides. Some of you as families have some rebuilding to do. But God will help you. And God will restore twofold all that you have lost. Amen. Now again, some of you, you, you've been working office jobs and things, and so you've worked from home. And you look at this and you go, none of this is relevant to me, Pastor. And you know what? I'm so happy it's not relevant to you, okay? I'm so happy everything is wonderful and blessed with you. But I've taught sermons for you in this, and I've had to take a couple of weeks to help our families that have really struggled in Jesus' name. So maybe it's not relevant to you, but it's relevant to the small businesses in our church that have lost everything in COVID-19. But God will restore twofold in Jesus' name. And what do you do when people envy you? <laughs> it's more polite to say social distancing. Okay. It's more honest to say envy distancing, but it's more polite to say social distancing. And everybody said? Would you take your communion, please? Last week, I began to remind you that Jesus not only died on a cross to take the punishment of our sins, he redeemed us from the curse of the law. And as you read through Deuteronomy chapter 28, do it in ESV, do it in NLT both, you begin to realize what an amazing thing Jesus did for us. Redemption from poverty, redemption from sickness, 
even redemption from the itch. Everybody said the itch. I've been redeemed from the itch. That's amazing. But one of the most beautiful things in there is you realize that families are destroyed in the curse of the law. Jesus redeemed us from destroyed families. We are family builders, generation after generation, in Jesus' name. Maybe in our generation, nobody before us built the family, but it can start with us in Jesus' name. And we build a name for our family that is strong. We build a name for our family that the family is proud of. Every new generation stands on the shoulders of the last generation. And we grow the family and we build the family because we have been redeemed from destroyed families. Ulitanatan, this bread, this bread represents, represents the body of my Savior, body of my Savior. hung on a tree for me. He took all the wrath of God. He took all the punishment my sins deserved. He redeemed me from the curse of the law. I remember what my Savior accomplished for me in Jesus' name. Let us partake of the bread together. Ulitanatan, this cup represents his blood that washed away all my sin. All of the records of heaven of all my sin have been washed clean. I have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. I stand in the presence of God, free from accusation. By the blood of Jesus, I remember what he has done for me. Let us partake of the cup together. We're so glad to have the kids back. We're so glad to have the kids back. It's been so long without... Not seeing kids is hard. Makes you feel old. Getting to see the kids again. So, you know, ushers, if the kids act up a little bit, just kind of smile at it for a while, please. They have been locked up for almost two years. If you've been locked up for two years, you want to run too, in Jesus' name. I don't want to ask for a show of hands because I don't want to embarrass anybody. But there are some of you here tonight, some of you listening at home. You've been wiped out. I want us to pray for them, everybody. Would you join your hands together? Father, we lift you, our families, that have been so devastated. And Father, they, they look around and they don't even know how to rebuild their lives. Yes. Father, let the simple truth tonight begin to give hope to them. Begin to give them guidance. 
Fathers, they go back and study these scriptures, birth new things and new dreams within their hearts. Father, show them the things that they can do. Help them to not focus on what cannot be done, but to look at what they can do. Amen. Father, rebuild every family business. Yes, yes, yes. In Jesus' name, yes, amen. amen. And everybody shout it. Amen. Everybody shout, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Family businesses rebuilt. Family businesses rebuilt. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Campus pastors, would you come, please? Amen. Let us all pray. Father, we thank you so much, O oh God, for your word tonight. And yes, Lord, we lift up to you your people who have been greatly affected by this pandemic. Lord, we thank you that your wisdom will be upon them as they take baby steps, O oh God, of rebuilding their family, their future, their finances. Lord, let your wisdom and your presence be upon them. And we thank you, Lord, that your people will be blessed with double restoration because, Lord, you are the God who restores. And God, as we see your people being blessed and being restored, we will give you all the glory and all the praises. And Lord, even as we depart from this place, we ask, oh God, for your presence to be upon your people. Give them, Lord, a quick ride home and let your protection be upon them. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you, everyone, and see you again next weekend.